Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Energy and the just transition featured as part of the fourth South Africa Investment Conference this week. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss some of the highlights. Hi Terence. Hi Shamal. President Ramaphosa highlighted some of the recent energy reforms as he sought to assure investors that some progress was being made. Yeah, I think that was a key point. I think that there's a lot of frustration around the lack of progress around the implementation of the economic reconstruction recovery plan, including the reforms uh, within that. And I think he used the platform effectively to try and communicate some of the progress that's being made across various sectors, including energy. And on energy, he mentioned you know, very much the uh, restructuring of Eskom, uh, the, the unbundling of particularly the, the transmission business, uh, which has now taken place. It is formally ring-fenced but it uh, hasn't been legally separated yet. There's some processes that need to take place. There's legislation uh, going through Parliament around the, uh, or first out for public comment around the Electricity Regulation Act and amending that to allow for a market to develop in the generation sector in particular. And having the transmission business outside of generation and then distribution allows for a leveling of the playing field so that when there's uh, power is bid into it, it's, there's a, there's a, it's seen as fair. The moment when you bid into the, the utility, although it's seen as treated as fair, you know, I think Eskom and government see it as treated as fair, there's still this perception that, that you know, Eskom uh, will be favoured over RPP. So I think that, that reform was highlighted along with the 100 megawatt reform, which allows for embedded generation of up to 100 megawatts to proceed without a licence. Now we know that that hasn't really been enough, that there's still a lot of red tape around those projects. So there's many announcements, but there haven't been many registrations with NERSA. So we see most of the mining companies have got a pipeline of mostly solar PV projects that are emerging as a result of that reform. But NERSA has very few registrations and there, there seems to be some other red tape that has to be uh, removed to allow for those projects to prop be properly registered. And it seems that the infrastructure unit within the presidency uh, under Operation Volendlela, I think there's a lot of focus on the new red tape units around just getting all those other things that are, that are in the way of registrations out of the way so that we can start seeing shovels in the ground and there can be some visibility of the progress that's being made in that sector. Um, so that was a big theme. You know, the, the other themes were around hopefully log freight logistics reform, we know the spectrum au auctions have, have recently taken place. And then there was the critical skills list, which allows skilled professionals to come into South Africa more easily, theoretically. So I think that was a, a key message from the president to say, you know, that, that they know there's frustration, that they know they've been slow, but th he pointed to a number of areas of progress. The African Development Bank also made some important commitments to the energy transition. Yes, I mean, they made the, as part of the, um, the announcements of pledges, they made a pledge of $2.8 billion over the next five years, but that's for a number of projects, including renewable energy. They also said they're working on a plan to give Eskom another $400 million um, to help it with its transition to renewable energy. We know that Eskom has developed this just energy transition strategy and has a pipeline of renewable projects as well as transmission line projects and also some switching of coal to gas uh, projects in that portfolio. And I imagine some of that funding could be to support that renewable drive because the African Development Bank made it clear that their focus now is very much on renewable energy. We know that they were a big funder of the Madupi power station, the power station that has been behind schedule over budget for many years. And they say very firmly that they're now focusing on supporting renewable projects in South Africa and in Africa. And in South Africa, uh, they've already supported Eskom with their Sierra wind farm, and they've, they've supported a couple of uh, RPPs with concentrated solar projects. But the next phase is very much around renewable energy. And there was also a mention and uh, raised number of eyebrows of a $27 billion facilities to support South Africa's just energy transition. Now, no details were given, and there was some concern that maybe the figure had been fudged, but they have confirmed that it is a $27 billion facility that they're thinking about to support South Africa's just energy transition. They haven't said, given any further details. They haven't 
explained over what time frame, because this could be over probably over multi-decades to South Africa's informal net zero commitment by 2050. So it could be a, a sort of a, a facility that really stretches, well, multi-decade facility rather than a single facility. But that would be huge because that's the equivalent of Eskom's current debt. And it's bigger than the 8.5 billion that was committed at COP26 by the developed countries to start supporting Eskom and South Africa's just energy transition, including those um, renewable projects, transmission projects. And obviously there was also, uh, there was some added uh, the discussion around electric vehicle manufacturing as well as, as hydrogen, but the main focus will be around electricity. The just energy transition was also the main theme of the energy breakaway session. Yes, uh, I think the, it was, and there's this view that this is inevitable. We're having to shift, and we're doing it for business as well as environmental reasons, and more and more the commercial rationale is being emphasized. Yeah, but, you know, the cheapest new electrons are coming from wind and solar. Obviously, those have to be supported by, by some form of uh, storage, and, you know, so there'll be, in, in the plan, there's an element of gas, there's battery energy storage, there's probably new pumped hydro schemes being discussed as well. We know that our current pumped schemes are not being fully utilized to their full extent, mostly because there's a lack of energy in the system to replenish those dams. But we are talking about more pumped uh, hydro. So the just energy transition theme was a major aspect. Eskim um, CEO Andre Dorator emphasized supporting those in the coal value chain those that are around those power stations that will be decommissioned and emphasizing the opportunity to use this as a stimulus, not only for Mpumalanga but for the country where we see the, you know, something like um, 68,000 megawatts of new generation capacity will have to come in to replace the 22,000 megawatts of coal that's going to exit the system between now and 2035. You know, because uh, the capacity factors of variable renewable plants are much lower, you have to have a much larger nameplate capacity. And they're saying Eskim's only going to account for 8,000 megawatts of that if they get the money uh, from these just energy transition funds. The other 60,000 are available for the private sector. And we need to really be accelerating uh, the deployment of these uh, renewable systems. Everyone on the panel agreed that the RP is just not reflective of the needs in terms of the pace and the scale of renewables investment that has to be taken place. And if we get up to that certainty of a much higher tempo, and we have the logistics capacity around that, a yearly tempo of procurement, yearly tempo of building, then the manufacturing will surely follow. And uh, I think sometimes South Africa has a tendency to put the cart before the horse, the localization cart before the horse. If that pipeline, if there's security of demand, the manufacturing investments are sure to follow. This all took place in the context of a serious energy market uncertainty. Yes, that hardly penetrated the conference, but we know with Russia's invasion of Ukraine in late February, energy markets are really in turmoil. We've seen gas and oil prices really spike. We are facing or staring down the barrel of some really hefty increases in the fuel price, and those are after really some big increases that we've already had to absorb up until March. So April would be the next the next point of contact at the pumps. As we know, we adjust these every every month, and uh, the, there's real concern that it's going to be above two rand a litre increase from next month, and it could even be more depending on what's happening in the markets and what's happening to the rand. So that didn't fully penetrate the conference, I felt, and it is a, a serious concern. There's serious security of supply issues as well. Countries really looking to wean themselves very quickly especially in Europe, of Russian oil and gas. That means there's going to be oil and gas that will be flowing into Europe that would otherwise have been coming to Africa. That's a serious worry because we need diesel, not only for mobility, but to keep the lights on. We saw how much Eskom has been burning uh, in the first few months of this year to keep the lights on or to minimize, even though it was high levels of load shedding, it would have been far higher levels had we not had the diesel being burnt. So uh, I think this is going to come front and center over the next few months. There was a big International Energy Agency ministerial meeting this year, which really confirmed that the key long-term strategy for energy independence across the world has to be 
the accelerated energy transition to renewable energy. No one can hold, as the one Irish uh, minister said, no one can hold your sun or your wind hostage. Whereas you can be held hostage by these countries that hold big oil and gas reserves. So long term, where everyone has to go, including South Africa, this is a huge opportunity for full energy independence. We know we've had fairly good energy independence because of our coal, but we're not going to be able to finance coal. We, no one's going to be able to build new coal easily. So we have to move. And the good news is there's no trade-off between clean and cheap. You know, the cheapest electrons come from wind and solar. So we need to accelerate that. There's a big opportunity in doing that acceleration that we could also overbuild. There's a big opportunity in that overbuild, having these surplus periods during the day in particular, where we can either charge electric vehicles or produce green hydrogen. That green hydrogen can be used domestically for long haul uh, transportation and mobility, or it could be used to convert into sustainable aviation fuels using the, the facilities that are already in place in, in uh, Secunda mm -hmm. to do that. And I think there is some progress being made on one of those projects. And, uh, and uh, it could also help the energy uh, diversification and energy independence of other countries that are looking to accelerate their diversification away from Russian uh, conventional gas. If we can provide this new form of gas or derivatives of that in the form of green hydrogen or green ammonia. So it is a big opportunity. It didn't fully penetrate this investment conference, but I think it needs to penetrate this national psyche. And I think the rising oil uh, prices and fuel prices at the pumps are going to start sharpening and intensifying our minds around this issue. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.